Hi there, welcome. This is Book of Mormon Reader, and we are working our way through the Book of Mormon, starting from the back, working towards the front, and we are on Ether Chapter 6 today. So thank you so much for joining me. Ether Chapter 6 in the Book of Mormon. And now I, Moroni, proceed to give the record of Jared and his brother, for it came to pass after the Lord had prepared the stones which the brother of Jared had carried up into the mount, the brother of Jared came down out of the mount, and he did put forth the stones into the vessels which were prepared, one in each end thereof, and behold, they did give light unto the vessels. And thus the Lord caused stones to shine in darkness, to give light unto men, women, and children, that they might not cross the waters, the great waters, in darkness. And it came to pass that when they had prepared all manner of food, that thereby they might subsist upon the water, and also food for their flocks and herds, and whatsoever beast or animal or fowl that they should carry with them. And it came to pass that when they had done all these things, they got aboard of their... Um, vessels or barges and set forth into the sea commending themselves unto the Lord their God and it came to pass that the Lord God caused that there should be a furious wind blow upon the face of the waters towards the promised land and thus they were tossed upon the waves of the sea before the wind and it came to pass that they were many times buried in the depths of the sea because of the mountain waves which broke upon them and also the great and terrible tempests which were caused by the fierceness of the wind. And it came to pass that when they were buried in the deep, there was no water that could hurt them, their vessels being tight like unto a dish. And also they were tight like unto the ark of Noah. Therefore, when they were encompassed about by many waters, they did cry unto the Lord, and he did bring them forth again upon the top of the waters. And it came to pass that the wind did never cease to blow towards the promised land while they were upon the waters, and thus they were driven forth before the wind. And they did sing praises unto the Lord. Yea, the brother of Jared did sing praises unto the Lord, and he did thank and praise the Lord all the day long. And when the night came, they did not cease to praise the Lord. And thus they were driven forth, and no monster of the sea could break them, neither whale that could mar them, and they did have light continually, whether it was above the water or under the water. And thus they were driven forth three hundred and forty-four days upon the water. And they did land upon the shore of the promised land, and when they had set their feet upon the shores of the promised land, they bowed themselves down upon the face of the land, and did humble themselves before the Lord, and did shed tears of joy before the Lord, because of the multitude of his tender mercies over them. And it came to pass that they went forth upon the face of the land, and began to till the earth. And Jared had four sons, and they were called Jacob, and Gilgah, and Maha, and Oriah. And the brother of Jared also begat sons and daughters. And the friends of Jared and his brother were in number about twenty and two souls, and they also begat sons and daughters before they came to the promised land, and therefore they began to be many. And they were taught to walk humbly before the Lord, and they were also taught from on high. And it came to pass that they began to spread upon the face of the land, and to multiply and to till the earth, and they did wax strong in the land. And the brother of Jared began to be old, and saw that he must soon go down to the grave. Wherefore he said unto Jared, Let us gather together our people, that we may number them, that we may know of them what they will desire of us before we go down to our graves. And accordingly the people were gathered together. Now the number of sons and daughters of the brother of Jared were twenty and two souls, and the number of sons and daughters of Jared 
were twelve, he having four sons. And it came to pass that they did number their people, and after that they had numbered them, they did desire of them the things which they would that they should do before they went down to their graves. And it came to pass that the people desired of them that they should anoint one of their sons to be a king over them. And now behold, this was grievous unto them. And the brother of Jared said unto them, Surely this thing leadeth into captivity. But Jared said unto his brother, Suffer them that they may have a king. And therefore he said unto them, Choose ye out from among our sons a king, even whom ye will. And it came to pass that they chose even the firstborn of the brother of Jared, and his name was Pegag. And it came to pass that he refused and would not be their king. And the people would that his father should constrain him, but his father would not. And he commanded them that they should constrain no man to be their king. And it came to pass that they chose all the brothers of Pegag, and they would not. And it came to pass that neither would the sons of Jared, even all, save it were one. And Orihah was anointed to be king over the people. And he began to reign, and the people began to prosper, and they became exceedingly rich. And it came to pass that Jared died, and his brother also. And it came to pass that Orihah did walk humbly before the Lord, and did remember how great things the Lord had done for his father, and also taught his people how great things the Lord had done for their fathers. Well, um, Ether 6, uh, I'm, because I'm moving backwards and I'm not usually looking ahead too much, I forget that this, that's where this story is. And there is, uh, I guess it's going to be tomorrow when we do Ether 5, when the, when the whole incident comes with touching the stones to make them light. So I'm looking forward to that. Maybe I will look ahead a little bit. Um, there's so much in here, my goodness, that, um, it just, when I, if I just go back to the beginning here, when they talk about, um, these little stones, the brother of Jared had amazing faith that he, when he was commanded to build these barges or these ships, he prayed about, you know, he's thinking about, huh, what's it, you know, if we're going to have to be completely shut up in the water, then there, we, we can't have windows. And if we don't have windows, how will we have light? And so he, he took his uh, inquiry to the Lord and the Lord basically said, uh, well, what do you think? And so Jared came, our brother Jared came up with the idea to have transparent stones uh, to glow and to give light and uh, well I guess we'll get that account tomorrow as we go to ether 5 I'm not sure exactly if that's where that is I'll have to check but um, so so there's a few things going on here there's incredible faith to the degree that okay brother Jared knows that he's not um, alone here because he's having a dialogue with the Lord and then uh, he asks him what to do and he brings these stones and so he says Lord would you touch these stones and make them light and so <laughs> so as the Lord touches these stones they well brother Jared sees his finger and just in that account there's a lot going on about people who don't believe that uh, that the Lord has a body, so he has fingers, and we're created in His image. That's an that's a wonderful thing to know. And then because now now because he sees it, and I I know it, that's not this account today because it's it's after this is, this has happened and they're already on their journey, but he the Lord shows Himself to him because no longer it's faith it's knowledge now. And so you have to ask yourself, do you believe that? Do you believe that the brother of Jared actually saw the Lord? 
Uh, do you believe that he has a body that he can touch these stones? Uh, do you, if you believe that you can hear the word of somebody else and their testimony instead of having to experience it yourself, then that means that you also have great faith. And when you have great faith, the Lord will not withhold himself from you either. Um, even if it's, you know, if you don't show his, his personage to you, um, at least he, he will come to you in the form of what he called in here, tender mercies. And I, I'm thinking about all of the, you know, have you ever been on a cruise? I mean, just even on a huge, comfortable cruise boat, there's some, oh, the turbulence that goes and you get seasick. Boy, I can't imagine. And they were on there for so long. Uh, and they were being tossed to and fro and completely dependent upon the Lord to blow them with wind, completely dependent on the Lord. Because since they were all closed up, uh, they they didn't have, you know, motor boats or, uh, you know, nothing. They didn't have paddles they could use. They had nothing except for their faith that the Lord would blow them. And so indeed he did. And um, think of, they had to be gone for a year. Uh, what did it say exactly? It was 300 and something crazy. 365, okay. 344 days upon the water. Good heavens. No wonder they were grateful when they reached the promised land. And they did bow themselves down upon the face of the land. I'd probably kiss the earth getting off that boat. I mean, you think about all the food they had to have and animals, almost like Noah. Uh, so much that they left home and they never intended to look back. That's a huge thing. I mean, I, I don't know. I just think about this and do we, do we today have that kind of faith that we'd be willing to leave everything? Um, last night in one of the episodes I was watching of one of my little favorite shows called McLeod's Daughters, one of the daughters, <coughs> Uh, had a visitor from a, a man in her past who she she didn't quite completely fall in love with, but she was on the path to falling in love with him, but discovered that he was in the witness protection program and people were uh, pursuing him to kill him because he was uh, um, testified in this trial against these drug people and thought he came back later as himself, not as his new name, and professed his love to her and wanted to move on with his life after the trial happened. And so they did. They fell in love, and uh, they were about ready to go on their life. He has a ring ready to propose to her and finds out that somebody's going to kill him again because somebody in prison had put out the word for a hit on him. And so... Uh, the the choice comes to his, you know, Jody, who is the one of the McLeod's daughters. Can you go? You, you have to leave everything. You can never ever come back. I, it's interesting that um, sometimes the the placement of what what scriptures we are, and I wonder, is that by coincidence? Is it chance? Is it timely? Is it a tender mercy for me here today that I'm recording this? and just had watched that last night. I mean, that's that's not something I could have even planned for because I didn't even look at the scripture today. I just opened it and boom, started reading when I went on air. So that's something. But watching her, you know, can I make that decision to leave everything and go with this person and never ever come back and never ride my horse again, never live on my land again, never have see my friends again. And we see it here. We see it with Laman and Lemuel. We see it with uh, Moses and the Israelites. And so these people were ready to leave. And they, they put their feet to action. And do we have that kind of faith today, if, if need be? Um, so that's, that's something to consider, certainly. Then again, another thing. Um, sing praises to the Lord. They, they finally, uh, while they're, you know, while they're in this barge, while they're in this condition, um, and getting from point A to point B over the period of a year, I mean, a year really 
That is such a long time. I mean, I thought I was forever being on a plane from coast to coast. That was five hours. And you think, oh my gosh, I got another friend who flies back and forth from Australia. You think, wow, that is a long time, 18 hours at a time. But here these people are doing it for almost a year. That's just incredible. And I love this. This goes to attitude. And I'm sure everything wasn't perfect the whole time, but look in verse 9. They did sing praises unto the Lord. Um, everything that we have, that we enjoy, they are tools for us. And they can be tools for good or tools for evil. And singing, I don't know if I could adequately um, endorse or, or do whatever about singing and the power of beautiful music. But this also is, um, singing could also be for bad things. So here they did it to sing praises unto the Lord. And they did thank and praise the Lord all the day long. Isn't that awesome? That here they are, they had a grateful attitude. We just finished a season of uh, Thanksgiving with the holiday just passed. And how does that change you when you have a grateful heart? How does that change you? How does it change your attitude? Does it make everything have a little spring in its step? Uh, instead of carrying the burdens and looking at the problems, I'm sure they had problems. I'm sure they were, it was stinky inside of there. I'm sure they were uncomfortable. I'm sure some of them were seasick. And yet, they didn't choose to focus on that. At least that's not what's recorded here. And uh, this made, this another thing in verse 10, I had like, what is this? No monster of the sea could break them. What kind of monsters were in there? Did they have the Loch Ness monster, those that looked like dragons almost? And then it says, I was thinking whales, and then it says neither whale that could mar them. So other than whales, walruses, dolphins, sharks, I don't know. That's an interesting, uh, interesting thing. I wonder if they tried and they felt, they felt a little you know, a pounding every once in a while. Kind of an interesting thought, isn't it? Um, probably a good thing that they couldn't see out there and see what was surrounding them. Because I'm sure that uh, the adversary did his part to make things miserable for them. But they chose, you know, they chose to be positive and they chose to sing. Um, do you sing? Do you sing in your church choirs? Do you sing in your car? Do you sing lovely music? Do you uh, develop a, a refinement of um, beautiful music? That's another thing I think is, is worth mentioning here. Uh, this weekend, the First Presidency of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints uh, held their Christmas devotional, and there was beautiful music to be had. Um, I, on Sunday morning, I like to listen to old conference addresses or whatever, and, and this month I've been listening to past First Presidency devotionals before church, and one of them they did was the Handel's Messiah, this beautiful singing, and what a beautiful, you know, to fill your, your soul with beautiful music, how wonderful. Um, let me talk about something else here, too. Um, leadership. Leadership is a, it's a blessing and it's a burden. And many people who are great leaders are reluctant leaders and they answer the call to serve, but not, you know, they may do it with a good attitude, but watching here and watching these people that they want a king and nobody wants to be it. I wouldn't want to be the king. I wouldn't want to be the president of the United States. I wouldn't want to do those things. In fact, every leadership position I have had to serve in the church is not something that I sought out, nor is it, nor is any leadership position in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints something that people seek out. It's something they're called to do. And it's not that they're reluctant, but they certainly um, you know, from the very beginning, the pattern was set when Jesus walked the earth. He called these people away from their professions and said, leave your nets, come follow me. 
um, will you follow the Lord? Will you leave your, you know, will you answer the call? Kind of an interesting thing here too. And uh, I think it's it's wise here in verse 25 that they talk about um, people saying, make him be the king. And the father says, hey, I'm not going to make him be the king. It's a big responsibility. If he doesn't want it, I'm not going to make him. And that's kind of an interesting thing. Um, are you a reluctant leader? Will you answer the call? Um, but they were lucky that the person who did was a good person. Oriha, it says. I mean, I could just see how that works. And do you want it? Do you want it? Do you want it? No, I don't. I don't want it. In fact, I've I've been in this situation where they were looking for a roadshow director, and we were in the room that I got called to be on the committee, and I, you know, I accepted. And while we were in the room on the committee. This was a couple of years ago. In fact, you can see some of the things that came to pass from that. Um, I was sort of, it was sort of put on me. And everybody in the room said, you, you know, we want you to do that. And I looked around like, what do I know about directing a road show? I don't know anything. And, uh, but everybody in there said, you know, it's got to be you. And we'll support you. And so I, I reluctantly but with faith and a little bit of, you know, I don't know, it was, it was a little bit scary, but uh, I thought, well, if, if that's what they want me to do, and the Lord wants me to do this too, and I'll have help, then, then he'll qualify me. So I said, okay, I'll do it. And so, and so indeed I did. And it was an, it was a wonderful experience. It was very humbling and it was a lot of hard work, but you can see how it turned out. You can look on LDS roadshows on my fan page and that was another thing that we did because I was willing that was a blessing that I have now in my life uh, that all those wonderful people that I worked with um, and learned about a whole nother culture we had another uh, ward in our building that we worked with uh, the Samoan warden we worked together and we came out with a, a great program that they were all proud of but interestingly I can I can hear this people saying, no, I don't want to do it. And I say, I, I understand. I agree. I just want to live my life. But George Washington did that in America. He was a reluctant leader. He said, have I not done enough for my country? But then went on to serve and serve and serve with honor and serve with greatness. In fact, I wonder sometimes about people who like want, want that. Why do they want it? Do they want it to serve or do they want it for power? And they want to oppress other people. It's an interesting thing to think of. Um, let's see, what else can I say in here? Um, I cannot imagine, oh, one more thing too, about preparing for a journey. We have time and time and time again been asked to prepare for things that are coming. And I just envision the, prepar the preparation it took and the length of time and the dedication to prepare for all of the food that they would need to eat uh, on this journey. And we have been counseled time and time again to get our food storage and that food will be expensive and it will be rare. I mean, to find it, and we've lived in such abundance, at least I have here, that um, we think, oh, we can just run to the store and pick that up. We can run to the store and pick that up. But again, I know I've mentioned this before, when something happens and everything clears out, do you have enough food to eat? Is there enough food to feed your family? Is there enough food that you can feed your neighbors if they're hungry? I mean, would it get to a point where you're so hungry that you start shutting out everybody else and say, this is for us? Um, one thing I thought was pretty awesome during the Japanese, they had a big... Um, hurricane there, a big tidal wave. Uh, I thought it was great that their honor, that people instead of hoarding everything from the store and buying a bunch, they could see a lot of people wanted it and they put things back so that other people could have them too. Which I thought, you know, you you kind of find out who you are, what you're, what you're made of in those moments of pressure. And I was deeply impressed by the 
that culture that they had honor and they cared for their fellow man even in their own time of peril um, I just wonder you know is there do we need uh, light bulbs do we need batteries do we need flashlights do we need those little kind that you hand crank I have one of those do we need matches how about a radio um, are you certified for um, a ham radio what about walkie-talkies do you have something like that in an emergency um, you know what's your what's your checklist of things that you need do you have food that will last a long time do you have granola bars around do you have snickers bars do you have wheat corn what what is it you think you'll eat what will you what will you need for your family if you have babies do you have diapers do you have wipes and uh, formula if you feed formula or baby food can you imagine how horrible would that be if you know I know you would probably go without food but making your baby do that too are you prepared for that I mean even just one feeding away and you know how miserable babies are so uh, I think the prophets have been wise to warn over and over and over have we heeded their warning have we hearkened to their counsel and uh, done what's necessary to prepare and be self-reliant that's a huge thing I know it is and the price of food is going up considerably um, one week yogurts 50 cents the next week it's 68 cents one week an increase of 18 cents that's incredible um, some of the the extreme physical conditions that the human person can endure is just great the amount of suffering that we can have it's just incredible uh, I wonder if it feels like it's something like oh I'd rather be dead than have to endure this but such as it is here we are and um, our, our time is spent today but I do thank you for joining me again and um, I guess we'll see you tomorrow on Ether 5. Have a great day. We'll see you tomorrow. Bye-bye.